Uh, a decade ago, Rob, my marriage collapsed after three months. I became a drug addict and was recovering. My company collapsed. My mum got sick with cancer and I hit, eventually hit rock bottom whereby I was two weeks from, away from losing my house. Out of nowhere, I started a podcast and all this stuff's come off the back of it. In this interview, I have a deep and intense conversation with one of the biggest Bitcoin investors, Peter McCormick. We are in a financial debt spiral. It's going to drive more inflation, which is going to have a widening gap in society. The reason I am a Bitcoin and I'm a fan of Bitcoin because for me, it is a peaceful revolution. They can suddenly find 38 billion for track and trace. They can't find 10% pay rise for nurses. They can't find 40 billion for mental health care. But why are they not putting into those places you said? Because they don't care. So careerist politicians. Yes, of course. To um, Andrew Tate, what do you think about him? I think he's an absolute A loud mouth, controversial character. I think he's the anti-hero for losers. To me, he represents most of what is wrong with the world. I commit to getting the billionaires and the money experts on this show, but I need your help. Like the video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on so we can all grow together. Well, what is your podcast to you? Is it a business? Is it firstly a business? No, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur for 17 years, so yeah. I've got 150 staff in my offices and that's my thing. I've got a property portfolio, so this is, we're making memories, meeting cool people. Um, Thank you. And I, I, yeah, we are. <laughs> and, you know, we handpick people most of the time, people I would like to have a discussion with. Um, and many of our guests have become really good friends afterwards, and I'm sure that's, that's the same with you. Yes, do we want to make money out of it? Yeah. Um, and have I financed it many years and not made money out of it yet, but now we're making good money out of it because of the, the ad revenue and things like that. Well, I think for me is, is that this is a huge accident. Yeah, I said I wanted his life, I wanted to go out and interview people. Did I ever think I would be flying around the world, interviewing some of the people I am and getting paid for it and mm. be able to employ six people off the back of it? No. And so... <clears throat> It is a business. I run it as a business. Mm. We have a PL, and l track the data, yeah. you know, look after the staff, but it is an accidental business. I get to do the best, what I think is the best job in the world. Obviously, I would like to play out front for Liverpool, and I'd love to be a Metallica, <laughs> but I'm not talented enough for that. Yeah. So outside of that, the best, it's the best job in the world. Yeah, it is. I get, I get to sit down with someone like you or somebody else. I'm, I get to handpick people I'm interested in and have a conversation mm. with them and get paid for it and get people to thank me for doing it. It's the best job in, in the world and I don't want it to become transactional whereby I'm like, I, I think of it as a business first. Mm. This is a hobby I'm getting paid for. Yeah. And yeah, I, I don't, I just, I can't see me getting for I would be surprised if Rogan paid for guests. I've got no proof yeah. by the way, so I'm not yeah, um, no, creating no. conjecture or anything. I'm just saying that I've had a, some discussions with people who are like, how did that guest get on? That guest is not the, the, the standard. How did that guest get on? And they're convinced. I wonder what kind of guest that is what kind of like? Because you wouldn't pay for a politicians. Politicians want to come on because they want yeah. the they want the platform. But you'd think Joe Rogan could get anyone, wouldn't you? I think he can get anyone. Yeah, it's whether they want to go on Rogan. Yeah, whether they like him. Would you or... pay fifty grand to go on Rogan? No, I would. No, I would. No, because no. I I don't even want to go on. I, look, I, what would I go and talk about? There's only one subject, which is Bitcoin. I think there's people way better to do it than me. If for any reason that in the world he suddenly said, I want. I want to talk to Pete. I want it because he's, he likes what I stand for, not because mm. he's getting 50 grand. Well, so do I. But what if there's doors you don't ever get to open because you can't? You can just speed it up a little bit. That is life. I'd love to have Donald Trump on the show. What's the likelihood of me getting connected with Donald Trump? Quite unlikely. But if I could pay to play, would I? If I thought I would never be able to get him in the long game, I'd go for it in the short term. If I thought I could get him in the long term, Maybe I wouldn't. Such is life. I mean, yeah. I, I'll take... I mean, I'm not telling you you're wrong. I just like having these discussions because you learn stuff. Uh, a decade ago, Rob, I, <clears throat> my marriage collapsed after three months. I became a drug addict and was recovering. Don't worry, my dad knows. I had a very bad cocaine problem. Ended up in hospital with and an... how long S ago was this? A decade ago with oh, an SVT. Right. My company collapsed. An advertising agency in Soho. Employed 40 people. Three million turnover. Um, I... Uh, my mum got sick with cancer and uh, a lot went on in a, in a few years and I hit, eventually hit rock bottom whereby I was two weeks from, away from losing my house. My company was gone, like everything was right. And out of nowhere I started a podcast, as, like I say, it's just a hobby. I was just 
I was in LA, I met Rich Ryan, I said, I want that. I bought the equipment on Amazon, phoned up a guy, did an interview, and then all this stuff's come off the back of it. Mm. So my view now is what will be, will be. Yeah. What will be, will be. You know, if, if you pay for Donald Trump, well, what's after that? Oh, I pay for that guy, I pay for this. Or what if you just get it? Like, yeah. Portnoy got, got to interview him in the White House. Yeah. I don't think he paid for that. No. And like I said, we don't pay for 90% because it is more fun when you get them for free. And if you get known for paying, then how are you going to get guests now? Because they've That's just- true. Yeah. I used to, when I used to work in advertising, um, during the, after the 2008 recession, a lot of our clients were um, restaurants, things like Pizza Express. And to try and get people in, they'll have to do discounts. You buy one, get one free, 40% off. There became such an expectation of it that the biggest difficulty that they had was getting out of it because it's like, well, Pizza Express haven't got a deal this weekend. Well, we'll go somewhere else. Yeah. And so if you did have that reputation, it might be like, oh, mm. yeah, Rob, Rob pays 10K if you go on. Yeah, well, I know someone who I know he pays for guests and he just outright says he doesn't, and I know he does. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's his business. Yeah, it, it is true. We can still mention it. I haven't mentioned his name. <laughs> Who's that? I'm not mentioning his name. You tell me afterwards. Yeah, I will. Yeah. As long as you don't publicise it, because I don't think it's fair. No, I have inside information. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll let him have his secret. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been doing it? Seven so, years. Sorry, I'm interviewing that's you That's all right, now. you can interview See, me. See, that's it's the fine. problem. It's fine, you do it. We've been doing this seven years. In fact, our anniversary is next week, is it? Yeah. Yeah, we just recorded the seven-year anniversary. Seven years. You'll probably be about episode 900 there or thereabouts. Wow. Are you, you've been from the start? <clears throat> uh, I joined the journey six months in. So June Pretty much. We didn't know what we were doing then. Do you have a mic? I don't, but I've been on the show here. Yeah. yeah, I try and get Harry involved in the show quite a bit. We He's... made that change about uh, 18 months ago. Danny, my producer. So is he in? Well, so he's off at the side, yeah. in front of his desk, but he has headphones and he has a mic and he has um, a camera on him. And very, like, very occasionally he has a question, which I don't have, which is a good question. And Maybe he... you should do that, Harry. Oh. Young Jamie. Yeah, like young, young Jamie, yeah. bald, bald Danny. <laughs> he looks like Tyson Fury. Right. He's from Manchester, but um, he, I mean, we have a screen with you know, pulling up the facts as well because it is a useful thing to have. But right. Danny becoming part of the show, I think, has, has uh, given the show more personality, takes the pressure off me, and uh, it, it, it just, I think it's made it a more interesting product. Yeah. It's quite funny though now because when we go away to these events, because we record abroad, or we go to conferences, and Danny's with me, people have got to meet him, it's great. But I've been going to events now, and they're like, oh, hi, Pete, how you doing? I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm good. And it's like, oh, is Danny here? And I'm like, fuck Danny. Yeah, yeah. My fucking show, no. <laughs> yeah. it, It's been really good for him, and he's now part of it. I yeah. mean, I'm not trying to tell you that he should give you a, a mic and a camera. I get him involved at time to time. He interviewed myself and my business partner for the anniversary one. Some of his laughs can be heard in the background, like with Katie Hopkins. You interviewed You're, Katie Hopkins? Oh, that's great. She's a... It was great. <laughs> My show is called Disruptors, so I have to challenge myself and I have to interview people I wouldn't normally interview because it's on concept with the show. Do you see that award she won? That, that, where they yes, so hustled um, I, I was on their show. I went on their show, the <laughs> that, guys who did it. What was yeah, the name of that award? Uh, the, well, it was C-U-N-T, wasn't it? Can you remember what it was? It was a cunt award. <laughs> for anyone listening, I really should explain, she got nominated for an award and whatever the four words were, they spelt and so they put it up on the screen and she collected it in front of her. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. See, there's certain people I won't interview. Not, I wouldn't interview her. Why not? Because I think she's an idiot and she has nothing. I, I'm not interested in someone who is, I think, controversial for the sake of it. But how do you know until you've met them what they're really like? I could tell. I could, I'm, Can you? I've got no interest in her. No. Donald Trump, I would. Yeah. Because I think he's funny. Yeah. I don't agree with everything, but I do actually agree with some things he stands for. Yeah. But someone like Katie Hopkins, I, I just think she's like a, a cancer on life. Yeah. And I think she is divisive um, and she doesn't, she doesn't stand for much I agree with. Mm. Uh, and I think the, prob the problem you have with a character like that is they, uh, they have a, an audience capture issue where she knows there is a percentage of the uh, world that wants to listen to her anti-immigration, quite right-wing views, and so she has to keep do, she keeps having to broadcast these to main rele maintain mm. relevance. But it's a razor wire because she can end up cancelling herself. Um, and I, I, I just I, I don't know I find that kind of that's not the kind of person for me. Mm.
Yeah, that's fair enough. There's plenty of people I've interviewed intentionally challenging myself who I didn't think for were, were for me. But my show is called Disruptor, so I like to I like to challenge myself on my own beliefs because um, I think sometimes we see the world how we think it is, not how it really is. Um, Andrew Tate, what do you think about him? I think he's an absolute. <laughs> Sorry to keep using that word because it's a, it's, a, it's quite a bad word, but I absolutely can't. St- I think he. Uh, I, I, I'm not into these people who uh, wrap some, some good messages, but obvious messages, uh, around uh, a bunch of uh, misogynistic shit. The way I see him is a loudmouth, controversial character who is running a marketing business to get people to pay for cr- crappy crypto courses or courses in dropshipping. That's his goal. His goal isn't about uh, um, trying to um, trying to teach you know, men to be strong, powerful, you know, confident individuals. His his goal is to create controversy and send people, get people to see his cars and think, "I want one of those." Let's go and sign up to one of his courses and make loads of money. To me, it's just it's like very transparent, uh, and I, I, I don't I don't like it. And and I think I mean, Coffee Zilla did a great thing on his courses the hellscape that is his courses. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of his. I also think, I, don't, I disagree on his view on masculinity. I don't think masculinity is about uh, showing that you go down the gym, you pump iron and you tell women exactly how it is and you act mildly misogynistic. I, th- I think you can be, I mean, I'm not. I think you can be in good shape, but also respectful and uh, and treat women in, in a respectful, equal way. I mean, the banks go bust, we'll bail them out. Yeah, there isn't enough tax receipts to do this. Mm. So what we've done is we've become an insurance provider, a failed insurance provider, who keeps getting bailed out from an endless money printer. All it does is make the poor poorer and the rich richer. So what is masculinity to you then? It's, I, it's not something I think about. No. I don't think, when somebody says it, I, I would say, your masculinity thing, this message you're getting across, I have close to zero interest within it. I think what you are doing is you are uh, trying to broadcast a message to a bunch of uh, insecure people whose life isn't going the way they want and they see you as a role model. Nobody I know who I think is a confident, uh, successful, uh, uh, well-meaning person would look at Andrew Tate as some kind of role model. I think it's somebody who can't get laid, who feels a bit and they see him and they're like, they're a bit excited about it and then they go and join his course I think it's very difficult to have a daughter and think of Andrew Tate as a great role model for women. Especially, I mean, my daughter came home one day and she was like, uh, she mentioned Andrew Tate and I was like, oh, a couple of some people said I should get him on my podcast. And she was like, all the boys love him at school. I was like, what do they love about him? And she was like telling me and I was like thinking, this is my daughter who's come into a world where she hasn't have to deal with as much as my mum did and my mum didn't have to deal as much as her mum did and so on. And now we now for some reason we've got these you know, groups of uh, people starting to perpetuate misogynistic messages. And it is still a man's world. Like, my daughter has things that she cannot do because she's not a boy. And there's, you know, girls, you know, right now, my daughter's current age, that period from early teen years, all boys have to do is get to school and do their homework and play football. My daughter now has to think about, she's going to go through her period. That's a whole thing she has to think about. And that's a different, that's a different well, world. Men have puberty though, don't they? Yeah, but it's very different to the scenario where you're thinking about, I don't know when my first one's coming. What if it happens in class? What if it happens in the swimming pool? How do I deal with this? The, 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 uh, the change in the hormones that are going to happen in her body. The fact is that, that, that at some point she's going to you know, start having boyfriends and it's most likely the boy who's going to be more likely the one saying, yeah, at some point her age when she's... I don't know, it might happen when she's 14, 16, 18, where a boy's going to pressure her for sex. She's going to go into the workplace, which is still, you know, we've moved on a, a long way in supporting women, but it's still a male-dominated space because when men want to do business deals, they go down to the pub or they go to the football, they have a meal. You know, women don't do that side of things. It, I think we've gone a long way to rebalancing what is a tougher world for women, and I think Andrew Tate is now, he's taken us backwards. Why is he so popular then? Um, who, my favourite character in Star Wars is Boba Fett. 
and I quite like Darth Vader. My know. daughter's two favourites. <laughs> yeah, I liked Return of the Jedi because the baddies won. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think some people like an anti-hero. I also think he's come at a time where why people are fed up with the world. You know, people are fed up in the world. You know, the kids are... We, 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 We've got a handful of kids who are going out and creating TikTok profiles or becoming footballers and they're getting to live this amazing, cool lifestyle that, that's getting broadcast into them. These kids are on Instagram or TikTok and they're seeing Bryce Hall, who's, I don't know, is he 20? Who's making millions. You know, you've seen these young girls making millions on Instagram and these kids don't realise that. You, you know, like making money is hard work. I've worked hard for 25 years, right? It's hard work. And we're teaching them, actually, it is hard work. So they've got all these pressures that we didn't have. I mean, you look at these 16-year-old girls on Instagram now. Like, they're all dressed up and doled up. They've got filters they're using to make themselves look different. They're putting fillers they're in their face yeah, really young. In their face. Yeah. 18, 19-year-old girls are getting boob jobs. Yeah. You know, we've got this, all this pressure. that we, When I was 15, 16, I played football. And we went down the park and drank a few beers. And th the only outside world we saw was four channels on TV and then some sky. All day, every day, they're getting broadcast with messages of, look at this amazing life these people are living. And, and some people are pissed off at the world. Young lads are pissed off at the world because uh, maybe they haven't got a role model who's taught them how to teach, to speak to a woman respectfully, or you know, they, they want to date a girl and they can't, or they've got a sh job, they've been through everything so I, think, I, I, I think he is the anti-hero for people I think he's the anti-hero for losers there's a yeah, there's a bunch of losers out there and I don't know why they're losers they've made shit parents when they start in life is it fair to call them losers because yeah some of them are losers yeah. some of them maybe just have had a hard oh yeah some love, some people yeah. some people have had a hard life and I mm. feel sorry for them some of them are losers I think if you see Andrew Tate as a hero you are a loser you, are, you, have, you have failed, you have lost at life because to me, he represents most of what is wrong with the world. You know, this- Can't you take the little bits of him you like and the little bits of him you like of other people and honor your own personality? Have you read Mein Camp? No. Do you want to take the little bits of good stuff that Hitler said or do you want to just put him away in history as a-, well, as I, a... I suppose that's my choice, isn't yeah. it? Because um, when I started in entrepreneurship, I studied all the big entrepreneurs in the UK, all the dragons, you know, and the big American entrepreneurs, and learned a load of stuff from them and pulled out little bits. And I think it really helped me become an entrepreneur. I think surely we can be self-aware enough to go, I like that element of that person and that element of that person and that element of that person, because fundamentally, I think we all have skills and flaws. I mean, maybe, it's, it's just not for me. I mm. mean, for me, he, yeah, I think a large part of his message is misogynistic. People defend him and say, no, he isn't misogynistic. He's just trying to, I mean, he is misogynistic. He says a woman is a possession. You know, he says, if a woman earns money doing X, then that should be my money. That's misogynistic, okay? Um, I don't need to go and look for the little bits of him that I like, because I just don't care for him. I just look for the people I like. Mm. You know, who, who interests me in the world? who's a writer or an artist. And by the way, I think there's other people you can throw into that camp who are musicians. You know, you can say you are equally getting away with a similar kind of um, Like? Um, Cardi B. Yeah, I never actually read her lyrics. <laughs> mm. yeah, young kids are reading her lyrics. Even Billie Eilish, my daughter loves Billie Eilish. I read the lyrics of Bad Girl. That's basically about a girl giving a blowjob. And I didn't even realize at the time. And like, it's like, well, hold on a second. Why have we got 12, 13 year old girls listen to a song about a girl giving a blowjob. That's, that's not good. And so, you know, I just, I'm a bit older. How old are you? 44. I'm 44. There you go. We've got a lot in common Where's already, haven't we? Who's older? January the 4th. Ah, uh, you're a few, few months older than me. Right. Um, I don't know many 44 year olds who think Andrew Tate is impressive and a role model. They tend to be like people like my daughter's age or teenage lad sometimes. My son, by the way, he's 18 and thinks he's a tool. And I'm proud of that. Uh, maybe in their 20s. I see very few 44-year-old men, <laughs> any of my mates thinking, yeah, he's a role model. 
I just think he's exploiting people to build an empire. Mm. And so I just, I, I don't need to look for, oh, the good things he stands for. Like, I don't need to look for the, the good messages that uh, uh, Hitler had in Mein Kampf. I don't need to look for uh, you know, the good messages. I don't need to look for the good messages and people I fundamentally disagree with and don't like. Mm. You know, I don't need to look for the good things in Tottenham fans. <laughs> They're all <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't need to look for those. Um, you know, we've, got, we've got limited time in this world. You and I have an ever decreasing amount of time and we don't know how long that stretch is. We've either got an ever decreasing 50 years or 25 years or one year, but it's ever decreasing. I would just like rather focus on people I like who I think are interesting, who've got something interesting to say. CBTCs are a dystopian nightmare from the future. It will be sold to us as a benefit. What are the benefits will get sold? It's easier for us to manage inflation. We can distribute money to people who need it. Richie Sunak supports that. Therefore, to me, he's the enemy. He's evil and I reject everything about him. Just a quick one. I have a digital financial toolkit for you that you can instantly download to make, manage and multiply money, build multiple streams of recurring income and increase your earnings. Now the link is in the description, it's completely free, it's my gift to you, so go and click the link in the description right now. Similar to Jordan Peterson, I've started to just kind of get a bit of bored of him. Yeah, I just, I, I mean, I think, I, I think he has got interesting things to say, but I'm struggling to find them as much anymore. And so I'm just, I'm... Why do you think that is? Uh, because I think he, I think a couple of things can happen to you. I think firstly, you can get targeted and it makes you angry and he has been targeted. And he seems angry. Yeah, he is angry. Yeah. And, I, and, and some of the things he's been targeted, I completely agree with him. Yeah. This re-education thing that's yeah. come out recently is weird. Um, but I also think Twitter can change you and it, re it, it, it can reinforce you in certain ways. And, and sometimes, you know, I just don't want to just see this. Like there's so much to complain about right now. I can't spend my time entirely where all the things are complain about. So I asked you earlier with your podcast, who are your ideal guests? This new one I would launch, I'd love to interview Jurgen Klopp because I love him. I want to hear about you know, the challenges of growing Liverpool and, and thank him for ch changing the fortunes of the team for the last 30 years, which has been pretty mm. I'd love to interview Stormzy because I think, I don't even listen to his music, but I think he's an interesting character. Mm. And I think he's got quite a positive message. Mm. I'd love to interview a nurse on the front, my mum is a nurse, a frontline nurse now, and say, what's going on in AED departments? What can be improved? I'd like to interview uh, somebody who's maybe striking for the rail, on the rail lines. Okay, why are you striking? What are the problems you're facing? How can people help you? Uh, there's a great lady on Twitter, I can't remember her name, she covers a lot of the immigration stuff. You know, people, like, people like Katie Hopkins would probably, if she had a Daily Mail columns now, would she be moaning about the immigrants? It's, I would like to objectively know where these immigrants are coming from and why they're coming here and how many are we getting compared to France and get some real data out mm. there. I don't have time in my you know, brain to deal with men need to be more powerful these days. We've given too much over to women. You need to get down the gym and you need to tell the woman that she's your... That's for like, I'm not, I'm not 12, I don't care. Mm. It, to me, it makes me really sad like that someone like that is the hero. I went down, I made a film in Harlow about inflation and I went down there and there are nurses now coming in there and using food banks because they can't make ends meet just with their salary as a nurse. And bear in mind, my mum was a nurse. I said this in the film, I used to go to Sainsbury's with my mum and do the shopping. And while it might not have been easy all the time, she could, you know, they could do the shopping. My mum and dad never used a food bank, right? Now nurses are having to, they have no choice. And these are nurses who are doing this following having worked their asses off through COVID. Now that is a hero to me. That is someone we should praise and celebrate. Not someone because he's got a Bugatti mm. and talks about controlling women and running a webcam business. You know, imagine my son looked at that and said, you know, this is great. What a hero. I want a Bugatti. I'm going to start a webcam business. Now, I've got no issue with sex work. I, People, anyone, any adults can earn the money they want the, the way they are. I just think we are starting to create heroes out of absolute. Mm. I want to talk about this nurses thing. <coughs> I've got a theory. People always ask why aren't nurses paid more? Because they're controlled by government and public sector, not private sector. Yeah, I agree. Um, people don't talk about that though. And I believe nurses should be, be paid more, damn right. But the government won't pay more. And it's the government's responsibility to pay more. Government are in massive amounts of debt. 
well, think about all the money that you pay in tax first off goes on national debt. I mean, I was trying to work this out and calculate, even if they I know pay the 3% numbers. interest. I know the numbers. So you do? do you, yeah, do you, so do you know how much, do you know what the total tax receipts for the UK government is? I don't know. It's about one, one or 1.1 1. 1 trillion. A year? Yeah. yeah. Do you know what the, the biggest line item on that spend is? I would have thought uh, repaying the national debt. No. The biggest Paying the politicians their salaries. No, no, that's really low. Nah, um, no, it's not really it, low. It, it is comparatively. Okay. So the biggest line item is uh, the NHS. It's 200 billion. So it's 20% of 20 ish percent. And it's a bucket percent. with a great big hole in it. Yeah, we should come back to that because I've, I've got views on that. Mm. What do you think the second item is? The national debt. Paying off the national debt? Yeah. So the second line item is paying the interest on the That's national debt. That's what I meant, yeah. So yeah. it's yeah. 120... It's 3.1 trillion, is it, the national debt? Yeah. I don't know the number, but it's, yeah. I know the interest alone is 120 billion a year. Well, that works out about 3%. That sounds there about right, yeah. Well, you're a money guy, you should know that. Yeah, yeah. Smart. <laughs> um, do you, know yeah, how much we, do you know how much we spend on education? Not enough. 73 billion a year. So we're now spending more a year on servicing debt. Yeah, which is getting bigger. Which is getting, yeah, it's getting bigger. We're more just servicing debt than we're spending on education. Yeah, okay? a lot more. So imagine you had that 120 billion in education. You could triple the education budget if you had that money for education. Now, could you imagine the quality of the teachers we would have, the quality of the materials they have, the sports opportunities these kids would have. Can you imagine what we would be given if we had that? Maybe they wouldn't be looking to an Andrew Tate as a hero because they would have heroes in their classroom. Imagine you could double the salary of teachers. Imagine the people, imagine, like uh, Louis C.K. does a whole skit about teachers and saying, why would anyone do this job? It's low paid. Also, if you do a brilliant job, what do you get? You don't get a bonus. You might become a head of department, might become a head. That's but pretty much the public sector, isn't it? That's why I love the private sector. I think there's, got... there's, there's, different, there's different opportunities depending on the job, but what I'm saying is, imagine you had that money for education. What the things you could do and the things you do with these kids. And we don't. We have 120 billion just on service and interest of debt. Why, are we so, why do we have so much debt? Actually, another question for you, or another point for you. If we want to pay off that debt over, to, say, t I don't know, 20 years, we have to take 240 billion out of our, spe our current spending, okay? Because 120 billion, so we're increasing the national debt by 100, 120 billion a year, right? If we just wanna get back to you know, parity, we have to take 120 billion out. And if we wanna start paying it off. And there's no upside incentive for a politician to do that, is there? Well, this is the problem. The whole system. You give politicians, the, this, is like, this is like when we blame one party, People are like, oh, we need to get rid of conservatives, bring Labour in now. And they're probably right. And what's going to happen? They're going to do exactly the same. Mm. Because there is no incentive for someone to, to, to bring in austerity. The conservatives tried. They yeah. did it in quite an evil way, but they tried. Could you imagine Labour coming in and saying, our problem right now is the interest on the national debt and uh, the country's getting into more debt. What we need to do is now pay off this debt. And so that we're gonna to have to cut our spend by 25%, which means all these line items, we've got to take 240 billion out. Who's gonna vote for them? No one. But if they come in and say, oh, Tory's rubbish, you know, we're gonna you know, reduce tax, and whatever they do, mm. they cannot do that. You cannot sell that policy to the public, which means whatever happens, we are now in what's known as a debt spiral. Every fiat currency, you know, dollars, pounds, mm tends to last about 90 years and they collapse. Yeah. We're seeing them collapse around the world before us already. We have Venezuela and Zimbabwe collapsed years ago. Lebanon collapsed in the last year. Uh, Turkey is collapsing. I think they've got like 90% inflation. We've hit this kind of 10% inflation. Um, with, with this inflation, we have a growing wealth divide. So eventually they cannot, they cannot get off the drug, which is the money printer. So we, we have now a spiraling problem that we cannot get out of. It, it's impossible because Either you pay off the debt, or you which don't. Or, or you go bankrupt, which you, well, they're not going to want to do either. You can't go bankrupt. You can default. Yeah. But if you default, you won't be able to borrow. Yeah. Um, you can print your way out of it, which means you essentially uh, uh, drive, you'll crash the pound, yeah. and which Liz trusted that, and, and we saw what happened there. Yeah. So what happens is it's, it's a death by a thousand cuts. We're going to have a slow death spiral of our currency. Hence why I'm into Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to get to Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the money system a bit more because yeah. um, I fundamentally agree with everything you said there. Um, and, you know, people talk about fiat as the, the ultimate Ponzi scheme. Um, 
in a way, fiat currency is almost like one of the most amazing inventions ever. I mean, you know, you run a business. If, would you like to be able to create your own currency and print it on demand uh, as debt? Probably. I would. Do you remember from our childhood a TV show called Round the Twist? They were yes. Australians. They lived in a lighthouse. Yes. Do you remember the episode where they had the machine where you could copy something, but it would do it in reverse? So if I put that in, the writing would come out backwards. And the guy put the money in, it came out backwards. He said, oh, I'll put the backwards money in, and it came out forwards. He printed loads of money. I always think of that. I always think of, of, of what the government has with a money printer. If I had my money printer upstairs, and I could go up there, and I could go and print 10 grand for 300 grand, would I do it? Yeah, I'll go yeah. with my Lamborghini straight yeah. away. And every, every problem you've got, you, that would be the solution. Yeah. yeah, but what happens if I keep printing that money? I keep putting money into the system and buying things. So I'm taking up demand. Uh, I'm sorry, I, ha I have demand. So I'm taking up the supply. So I'm increasing the prices of things. And I don't think people really... Our, our government doesn't teach people about education, uh, about finance. Like, what incentive is there? We teach a little bit of Keynesian economics, which is basically money printing, uh, if we study economics, but we don't teach any form of Austrian economics. Well, or why would they want you to know and expose their own system? Of course. Yeah. But you sound like a conspiracy theorist when you say this. Yeah. They're like, oh, Pete's crazy. He's a conspiracy theorist. It's like, no, go on the OBR website, the Office of Budget Responsibility. It's there, plain and simple. Now get an get a, a Economics 101 book out about supply and demand, and then what happens to prices, okay? If you put cheap credit in the market, if you have 0% interest rates, you're saying to people, you can borrow money for free, mm. okay? And if you borrow money for free, you're gonna buy stuff. But when we have 0% uh, interest rates, who gets the large amounts of money? Yes, you can get a low interest rate mortgage, one, one and a half percent. But you can go out to massive, massive companies or funds, can go and borrow billions, and then they can go out and buy the assets. BlackRock buying homes, or whoever it is buying the homes out in the US following the 2008 financial crisis. You are, you are, allowing an elite group of people to, to distort the market, to go and take up the assets, the scarce assets, which makes houses less affordable for the peasants. And so it's not, this is not conspiracy theorists, this is the serious stuff, this is Economics 101. We extend, my daughter's got an exam today, sorry, I'm going off on one. I was like, well, she's like, we were driving school, she said, oh, I've got a test first thing. I was like, what is it? She said, Latin. I was like, okay, she said, yeah, basic, I've got to remember words. I've got to like memorize them and write them out. We are teaching kids to go to school still Remember and memorize recall. facts. Yeah. When, what do we give them? It's over there. We give them a su supercomputer in their pocket. They've got a device that's more powerful than the, the, the um, Apollo whatever that got us to the moon. Is it 11, 10, 3, whatever, 13? Is that not the film? I think that's the film. Um, <laughs> anyway, we're giving them a supercomputer in their pockets where they can go on and ask any question and get an answer. They've, we've now got chat, chat GPT where it can write your uh, coursework for you. We're sending them to school to memorise facts when we're not teaching them about finance, budget responsibility, how the economy works, philosophy. You know, we've taken sports away from them. We've taken the arts away from them. All the things, that the, these great skills that they would need. Why? Why have we done that? Well, I've been, try they? I've been trying to find this answer for probably a decade. Um, I think I know the answer. I think I know the answer. So we need a dramatic pause now. A, dramatic pause. <laughs> a drum roll. I think I know the answer is that... Well, because it creates decentralisation. It creates... No, no. I think, um, I think governments have... Uh, Governments employ the most stupid people in our society. They, I think, the, outside of things like uh, the police, the fire, the you know, really important services, the general kind of like local councils or government, they employ, we employ the most stupid people in there. And we employ people who cannot lose their jobs. And we give them jobs where they have to come up with new rules and ideas. Like every single new law, is an encroachment on your freedoms. Every single one. Now, some we can argue are good or bad, but every new law is an encroachment on your freedoms. And in doing so, what we allow them to do is to expand and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I'm going to say something that sounds really intelligent, but I'm stealing this from somebody who said on my show, so I'll just be yeah. honest. Um, since World War II, our government's become an insurance provider. Okay? So what happened in World War II? We had a massive amount of debt, so we could uh, uh, 
defend Europe against the Nazis, and we, we you know, we took on massive debt from the 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 Americans to help support us in that war, and it, you know, and a great thing we did in defeating the Nazis. Following that, the UK had a lot of debt. What did we do after that? We increased taxes and increased productivity. But ever since then, what we've become is an insurance provider. Okay, you're unhealthy, here's free healthcare. You're retiring, here's um, social security. Here's free bus passes. We've become an insurance provider. Banks go bust, we'll bail them out. Yeah, 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 but we've become an insurance provider. But the taxpayer's paying the insurance, we're yeah. paying it ourselves. But there isn't enough tax. There isn't enough tax receipts to do this. Mm. So what we've done is we've become an insurance provider, a failed insurance provider, who keeps getting bailed out from a, 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 an endless money printer. Okay, that's what we've done. And it doesn't work. All it does is make the poor poorer and the rich richer. And it divides society. That's all it does. I don't know the answer, I just know that it's the problem. And no, I'm not an uh, anarchist by any stretch of the imagination. I think we need government, but we need government with responsibility. Yeah, you know, and I, don't, like, I try and think of ideas, but I'm not smart enough, but I'm like, the government has a budget, if the government goes over budget, should that tr trigger a what general election? Have, yeah, what about if they had the same rules as the private sector? Because if you and I trade insolvently knowingly, that's fraud. We yeah, can go fraud. to prison, but they've been trading knowingly and insolvently forever. For decades. Yeah. yeah. So what about if they had the same rules as the private sector? What about if they had upside reward? Because I think governments are one of the worst allocators of capital that exist. Because they have no upside. One? Shit. All right, Who's the worse? worst. Who's yeah, <laughs> the worst. Well, my child maybe might be worse. Um, they will just go and buy Lego with it. Um, I guarantee you. But they don't get any upside for investing the money well, and there's no downside if they lose the money. Whereas us, us, we have upside and downside. But what you've got is people working in government departments coming up with stupid rules all the time. And what they do is they extract value from the productive parts of society. And look, and I've got no issue with tax. I mean, I pay tax. And, and, and I think we should pay tax. And I like the fact that we yeah. have an NHS. But it has and to I, be fair and equitable. It does, and it has to- and it, it has to go in the right places. Yes, but we don't. What we have is stupid people extracting value from the productive people in society with no recourse. With no recourse. Mm. Who've never run a business, probably. Never run a business. Yeah. And, and, and very few people understand it because very few people know what re is really going on. And they won't teach you in school. They won't teach you in school. You they won't teach you in school. When people like you and me talk about it, we, people think we're conspiracy theorists. It's just like we need to do a better job at educating. Like when I say we, the government, they're not going to do it. They're all a bunch of morons. Mm. They're all arguing about, they all come to the middle, too scared to offend anyone. You know, yeah, whatever. It's up to people like you or I now to get this message broad and wide. We know that we can't trust the media anymore because it's not re it's basically corporate media. I don't hate the BBC. I think the BBC does some good stuff. And I think there's some good reporters who work for Sky News. But generally speaking, the corporate media, uh, media doesn't do much. There's a real lack of investigative journalism. People like you or I, who have people who listen to us, have a duty to not be captured by audience, not waste, well, me, and not waste time on Andrew Tate to focus on telling people the reality of what's going on in the world. I think that's a duty we have because we are in a, we are in a financial debt spiral. If the debt's not paid off, the debt's getting bigger. And if the debt's getting bigger, it's going to drive more inflation, which is going to have a widening gap in society. And what actually, it, what, it, what, what happens if, you, uh, have, if the gap gets too wide in society? You have revolution. And those are bloody and dangerous and people die. You know, let's just, be, let's just be very honest about that. I was out in Chile during the riots and the protests there. People, people protest and people die. You know, we have seen that all across the world. And we should, the reason I am a Bitcoin and I'm a fan of Bitcoin, because for me, it is, a, it is a peaceful revolution. It is a way to educate the people around money, educate the people around government and peacefully protest. Because I'm not picking up a pitchfork, I'm not picking up a gun, I am sending a transaction to you. I'm doing a financial exchange with no intermediary, and that to me is a, a peaceful revolution. So who controls the world's money? Oh, that's a good question. Well, it depends which money we're talking about. Nobody controls Bitcoin, and that's part of the world's money. Um, but okay. generally speaking, fiat, fiat currencies, well, yeah. they tend to be controlled by a combination of government and central banks. That tends to be it. The, the problem is, is, I don't think many people go in there thinking, ha ha, I'm going to be evil. The incentive structure exists so evil things happen. 
that's the incentive structure. You know, whether it's in the US and lobbying and you know, trying to deregulate markets for the benefit of specific industries or you know, it's the government that's like, well, we want to stay in power, I don't want to lose my job, so um, you know, this is a policy we're going to pace that we know the government cannot afford, but we're going to do it anyway and we'll borrow more money from the central bank and we'll deal with the debt. Like, like the incentive structure is... And, and, and if you think about it, the political cycle's four years, four to five years. That is short term. The damage that's caused by the relentless printing of money or borrowing of money, it goes beyond that cycle. <clears throat> the problems we are experiencing right now started in 2008. The recovery from 2008 when interest rates went down to zero and we had um, you know, massive borrowing there. These things take years and decades to play out, but the political cycle does not allow you, does not allow the politicians the chance to challenge this because they will not get voted in. So it's the incentive structure that is screwed. Mm. Do you think maybe, you know, Vanguard, BlackRock, Blackstone, you know, people talk about those. You think they have as much control over the money than maybe some banks? I mean, they have a lot of money flow. I mean, I'll be out of my depth. I mean, I can, I could uh, come up with a thesis that they are and explain it here. And I, 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 I just don't know. Mm. But what I do know is like someone like BlackRock, someone like Larry, it's Larry Fink, right? Mm. Yeah. You know, when he, when he promotes ESG, he has an incentive to promote ESG because he then creates the investment market where BlackRock puts the money and benefits from. Mm. I have no doubt that the likes of BlackRock and you know, other, you know, other large companies and institutions work together and manipulate the markets. I mean, but I'm out of my depth. Mm. Yeah. Uh, possibly, but I don't know. Mm. I don't want to guess. Yeah. So the reason I ask these questions by the way, I'm used to asking questions. I'm not used to being a guest. <laughs> Most of the things I'm saying now, I'm just repeating things other smart people have told me. Yeah, well, I agree with virtually all of them. I don't think in our money discussion you've said anything I disagree with. I have the same opinion. I talk about this a lot because I really feel like if you, if you can understand how the system works, it gives you a bit of an advantage. Um, because, for example, if you understand um, the, the way fiat currency works, well, don't keep too much of it. <laughs> Simple, really, because then your money's not going to be eroded by in inflation or whatever. And, um, you know, I know the conspiracy theorists love to talk about the great Ponzi scheme of fiat currency, but... It's a, it, the, the government running the fiat system is a Ponzi scheme. It is. Yeah, the fiat system's a pretty amazing invention in some ways, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, but, well, perhaps it's... I mean, again, this, somebody will know better than me. Pa perhaps it's the central bank's involvement makes it a Ponzi scheme, or when it becomes a debt spiral. Look, fiat money exists and existed for a reason, and we need it, and it's done a lot for the world. You, you couldn't have got here without fiat money because you needed to buy the car, and yeah. buy the equipment, and buy yeah, the yeah. petrol. Yeah. It is the corruption of the fiat money system by central banks, where you have eight or 10 guys in a room pulling levers to try and balance an economy with no idea of the, the, the long tail effects of that. That is, that is the problem with that and the government's ability to influence central banks or to borrow endless money from central banks to run whatever deficit they want. They're, that's the two problems with the fiat system. It's the lack of rules. Like you said, they should just have the same rules as us. Mm. My view is if a government is going to run a, a, a deficit, then that should trigger a national election. As should Liz Truss? It's a penalty. Or as, a potential as, penalty. As should Liz Truss standing down have triggered a general election because we now have an unelected psychopath as a leader? Don't you? I'm probably going to get a load of hate for defending Liz Truss, but I couldn't give a fuck. I'm just going to say it. She's the only one I've seen in recent times in the UK that had any desire for growth. Oh. Yeah. And she got freaking kicked out in 42 days. Yeah, but but she she ran a set of policies which the, uh, she hadn't run by the, what is it, the, was it the Office for Budget Responsibility? I or, believe so. She didn't even run them by those, you mm. know, who would have probably said, these are great conservative policies, low tax, you know. Um, well, not uh, that low, but well, a bit lower. Yeah, reduce tax yeah. and, and uh, incentivize, uh, incentivize growth. growth at a time when we're entering a recession, we've got high inflation. That is not the time. When mm. you, yeah, again, I'm out of my depth, but at a time of, uh, at this kind of time of period, we've got high inflation, 
which they haven't brought under control. How has the US brought high inflation under control with higher interest rates? They've, you know, the Fed keeps That's hiking the, the rates. the main way to do it. Yeah, but they haven't really done that enough here. No. Inflation's still at, what, 10.5%? Yeah, and, and people do not forget, uh, remember, sorry, that the average interest rate's 5 or 6%, and people have got pissed on 0% for 10 years and think that's normal. Yeah. I remember my, all my <coughs> mortgages and all my properties were 6%. I thought that was a good deal. I know. I've, I got an email from my bank saying I'm getting 2.8% on my interest on my savings. I'm still losing 7% to inflation, yeah. but I'm actually getting an interest rate now. Yeah. You know, these low interest rates, they distort. They're drugs. They, they, you know, and they warp, they warp the financial yeah. systems mm. because... They, they have no cost of money. money need, borrowing money needs to have a cost. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and so anyway, so back to list trust. I mean, I th- I, I, I'm historically a conservative voter. My dad voted, voted conservative. And when I first voted, he was paying my way in life. That's why I voted conservative. My brother did the opposite and I used to love watching them argue. And also I just wanted to like suck up to my dad. So I voted conservative. <laughs> but I stayed a conservative voter uh, because I... I, I the idea that you get to keep more of your money that you earn is something I, I agreed with. I'm, I miss traditional conservative uh, policies. I use some proper capitalism, which we don't have right which now. Which we don't have yeah. now. No, what we have is, uh, we have a, what do they call it? A, oh, I forgot the word they use. Um, but we essentially have a system which benefits the elites within the system. Again, I'm going to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but we've built a system which allows the largest banks to f- up and be bailed out and for people, to, large institutions and funds to have access to cheap capital to swallow up the assets. I, 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 we don't have a traditional conservative policy anymore. We don't have roll your sleeves up and work hard. We don't have, what we have is a government that is just increasing and increasing in size cannot operate uh, 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 responsible economic policies and we have a widening wealth gap. Uh, we have people, like untold numbers of people relying on food banks. We now have, what is it, heat banks? People go, go to stay warm. I mean, this is the United Kingdom. Yeah, we were a successful first we world. We were. Well, we still are mm. a successful first world. Our GDP is high enough that we should be able to support the poorest in our country. We waste so much. How much money did we waste on, on, on PP? You know, that track and trace app. I mean, if you're a, a company and you run your own business, you're not spending 20 billion on an app, are you? You're trying to get it for 100 grand. Yeah, unless, you're, like, unless your mate's running the company that's building the app. Oh, there you go. And do you know what? The, the only interesting thing about that, they suddenly found 32 billion for that. It's a bit like um, when Liz Trust crashed the economy, they suddenly were able to borrow billions to, uh, to buy up the gilts. Okay. What if they suddenly found 40 billion to build football pitches around the country for kids to play football? Why can't they just suddenly find that? What is the reason they can find 40 billion all of a sudden to you know, protect the bond market? It just appears. They've just suddenly got it. They can suddenly find 38 billion for track and trace. They can't find 10% pay rise for nurses. They can't find 40 billion for football pitches. They can't find money for uh, mental health care. But they can find, they can protect the bond market. So, why? Because they can find money whenever they want. But why are they not putting into those places you said? Because they don't care. They just, these people do not give a So careerist politicians. Yes, of course. As opposed to having a proper vision. Um, and may, you know, maybe they came in with good intentions. But if you're in a corrupt or bent or failing system, how do you succeed in one of those systems becoming? You're, you're an entrepreneur. Name me one politician you look at now, you think I'd give you a job. None. What, would, mean, you employ, none. what would you employ Matt Hancock to do? I'd get um, a split of his, celeb- I'm a celebrity cut. I think he got paid 360 grand for that. Mm. No, I, no, I wouldn't hire any of them. Okay, so you wouldn't, what would you employ Liz Trust to do? Wouldn't hire her to do anything. Would you employ Rishi Sunak to do anything? No. What about Ben Wallace? No. Okay, so what about Keir Starmer? No. I don't mind Angela Rayner. I think she's all right, even though she's Labour. What I'm saying is you would not recruit one. I wouldn't recruit any idiots. 
Because they, but we're giving them the most important decisions in our country. Why are these kinds everyone, of people coming through the system then? Because they are not employable within the private sector. The only time they become employable within the private sector is when they leave government because they have influence. Like Boris Johnson right now, was he on one million the last week? Or 2.3 million since he's left Do you think office? a lot of people are doing politics for that then? So I, don't, I, don't, I don't know why they're doing it. Well, I, you know what it's like. You know when you're like at uni and there's like the young conservatives, young ladies, what the f weirdos. It's not the people you think, oh, he's cool. It's not your mates you go, no, it's not real people. It's the weirdos. Mm. Okay, no one else wants to, also no one wants to do that job because you have your life ruined. Because um, uh, you're going to get, I mean, if I became a politician and they found out some of the stuff I've done in life, and I'm not going to confess because my dad's here, but I mean, my, I'd be counsel and I'd be done for. I yeah. could not become a politician because of my background, you know. Yeah. So all these things that point out to the private sector being the solution to all this, yeah. We just need a much smaller government. Mm. I'm not, I'm not anti-government but we need a much smaller government that is not rent-seeking of the productive people in society. Every time, when you pay 40, 50% tax... Yeah, and the rest? Well, say you're paying 50... Well, yes, because you that, pay your tax. Corp, yeah. income, business rates, yep. national insurance, and then everything you buy has got tax added on like that. It's two-thirds plus of your money. And then when you die... Pay you another 40%. Yeah, so your kids don't get it. So we tax and tax and tax. Yeah. But, but just let's be, let's be super generous and say it's 50%, let's just be super generous. You, we're in January, you have to work until July until you actually earn any money. Yeah. To give that money to the You're government. You're working half your life for them. Yeah. yeah, you are working half your life. Are you getting value for money? Are you? I mean, I'm, I'm grateful when I need my passport, they do a good job with that. And if, if you had a heart attack out there, you'd probably be grateful for the NHS and the ambulance service. Not even now, I, I, you know what? I. Don't use any part of the National Health Service anymore. I have private health care and I use a private doctor's hand. There's a private doctor's So you're paying for the NHS through your taxes, but you're having to also pay private. And I'm happy to do that because I want, I, I want... You're double paying. I've been to America, right? And I, I know what happened. People, someone can break a leg and have their life ruined. They can break their leg and they don't have insurance and their finances are destroyed because it costs them 200 grand. Yeah. Okay. It's, someone can have a heart attack. I, I don't like that system. I'm glad we have a system whereby anyone, no matter who you are, can get seen. The problem is we stretch that system to the limit. We're now risking the lives of people because it can't pay for itself. That, yeah, I need the NHS if I have a heart attack. It's not a private service coming for me. Mm. But the doctors, it's a three week wait for an appointment now. Yeah, unfortunately being in a position I can do this, but I. If I get an appointment, it's 45 pound, I get either seen the same day or the next day. The doctor, it's the same doctor every time, he knows me by name, you know, he knows, I'm, I'm happy to share private things with him because I get to know him. Mm. And I'm glad I have that. But we have allowed these rent seeking politicians to extract everything from the productive people. So it has that uh, compound effect is that you now can't allocate that capital into productive ways. Just say, just say tomorrow we were able to get rid of 50% of the government and your tax was able to go down to 25%. What are you going to do with that other 25%? Hire, hire more staff. Hire, yeah, yeah. yeah, build products and services. Invest in Spend it. money in marketing. Yes. All go back into the system. Yeah. yeah. You, Grow the you, economy. You are a good allocator of capital. And do you know what's great about the, the market is that what happens if your allocation's bad? You get penalised and, and you have to start again and skill up again. And you learn a good lesson. Yeah. Okay. And you make money if you do well. What happens when the government makes a mistake with their allocation of capital? Well, they hide it, they lie about it, they spin about it and nothing. They tax us more. What we are, we're stuck in this position where everyone thinks this party is going to be best for our country. Oh, they're not so good anymore. Let's go to this party. Well, surely having a t just two options is not good, is it? Well, I mean, we have more options here, which is a uh, you know, release on the pressure valve, which they don't have in the US which is even worse. Mm. But really, we have two options here, don't we? Really? No, we now have a third option. Which is? Bitcoin. And I keep coming back for that. We've, I, we've got a section on that, don't I know. worry. <laughs> but that is a third option. I now know I don't have to vote. I don't care. I know my vote has no impact at all now. It has zero impact. And I also do not want to vote for what I believe is an idiot, whether it is 
Keir, Keir Starmer. Did you earlier refer to a psychopath as Rishi? Yeah, Rishi Sunak is a psychopath. I think he's, I think he's evil and I think he's a psychopath. What do you mean by that? Well, like, firstly, I saw him, did you see that video of him in the back of his car when he didn't wear a seatbelt? He was, like, literally talking to us like we're f***ing five-year-olds. Like, we're going to be doing this for the economy. We're going to be creating jobs. He sounds like he's talking to primary school children. It's like, what, why are you talking to me like this? I'm an adult. I pay your wage. Why are you, you patronising me? Like, that to me is not someone that, who is, I think instills any faith in the power government. Secondly, he's absolutely a massive proponent and supporter of uh, CBDCs, which is dystopian Chinese future, yeah. which is control surveillance state, which is... I fundamentally By CBDC, central bank digital currency. Yes, yeah, central so, bank digital currency. Yeah. So anyone listening, at the moment, you know, we have a dece- we kind of had a, even our uh, our money is kind of decentralised in that, you know, I have cash. Yeah. I can give you cash, and it's kind of out of the reach of the government. We get, gradually move into digital money, which means every transaction is being tracked. And anyone, just so you know, anyone listening, every single transaction you do on your card is being tracked, you know, every single one. But still, that, that runs through the banking system, which is separate from the government. A CBDC would be you would have a, an account with the Bank of England. I know they're meant to be independent of the government. Yeah. But what that means is... is For that, those that were listening, a double hand raise just questions that. Well, that, yeah, but what that yeah. means is, is that you can have your money stopped. Mm. At any point, if you fall out of favour... Again, this is going to sound conspiracy theory, so I'm going to go down the conspiracy theory route and then I'm going to give someone reality. At any point, the government can turn around to you or a group of people and go, we've stopped your access to money. You have no access to money now. Yeah. Now, imagine waking up tomorrow and your only, your only wallet was your CBDC wallet and the government paused you. Okay, the immediate effect is, I can't buy groceries. I can't eat. The medium-term effect is I can't pay my mortgage, I get evicted from my home. The long-term effect is I cannot function in society without money. Now, our governments, they are meant to, they're meant to serve us as constituents. They are meant to, we vote them in and they're meant to serve us. When we move to a system of CBDCs, we are now slaves of the government. And that's not me a conspiracy theorist. We can see this in China. China is a surveillance state. China has a CBDC. China has a social a credit score system. If you do not, if you criticise the government, they can switch you off from the banking system. They can stop you buying train tickets, accessing transport. We can see the future, you know. Sci-fi writers are very good at, uh, pre- oh, sorry, uh, film writers are very good at predicting the future. CBDCs are a dystopian nightmare from the future. It will be sold to us as a benefit. Let's just. What are the benefits will get sold? They'll get sold. You know, it's easier for us to manage inflation. We can distribute money to people who need it. Whatever stupid reason they come up with, it is dystopian future nightmare. Richie Sunak supports that. Therefore, to me, he's the enemy. He is evil, and I reject everything about him. Wow. Yeah. So why is Bitcoin the solution to government, then? Oh, God. Um, hmm. The thing you've been wanting to talk about. So... Then. so there's, Bitcoin will say this thing, Bitcoin fixes this. I'm not saying it fixes everything. But in a world where we've got you know, an ever-decreasing amount of freedoms, an ever-growing surveillance state, yeah, an ever-growing watchful eye, or Bitcoin is the one thing they, can, they cannot control it. It is a decentralized money system. Now, if I want to send money to you via my bank... I can do it, but I know that transaction is being tracked by the government, and they can also stop it. Oh, perfect example. If I go to the bank, to, well, if you go to the bank today, and you say, I'd like to withdraw £5,000 cash, what's going to happen? Load of checks and probably get rejected and ask a load of questions and money laundering excuse. Yeah, okay. Yeah. They want to know. Yeah. Um, every time, every time I withdraw cash, by the way, I always say it's for drugs and hookers. With them, <laughs> but they always they they always do that. They yeah. want to know. It's like, but it's your money. It's your money. So yeah. I I bank with Lloyd's TS. I'm going to give you a couple examples. I bank with Lloyd's. I used to bank with Lloyd's TSB. I was with them for 25 years. About two years ago, I get a phone call, um, and it's like, hi, Pete. It's so and so. I'm I wanted to do the, a review of your bank account. I want to ask you about some transactions. I was like, sure. What? And she said. This transaction on this date, what was it for? And I went, it's none of your business. 
And she said, huh? And I said, do I have to answer these questions? She said, no. I said, good, I'm not answering them. I didn't say this, but in my head, I'm like, I am a grown man with two children. I've run multiple successful businesses. You know, if you suspect me of a crime, report me to the police and let them investigate me. But you are not phoning me up and me have to give you a reason for every one of my transactions because I don't know you for shit. I don't know who you are. When I just bought my last house, I had to send six months of bank statements. So somebody who I don't know gets to go through my bank statements and go, oh, let's, let's see what he's spending money on. Yeah, that's, it's a complete invasion of pr pr privacy, right? Yeah, this is where the world we exist in now, this complete invasion of privacy. Privacy is the, one of the fundamental pillars of democracy. If you cannot privately hold opinions and privately vote, and you cannot privately uh, operate within society, what you have is coercion within politics. So we're lucky we live in the, the UK, right? If you live in China, you cannot privately hold certain opinions. If you're on WeChat and hold certain opinions and they're said, you can get, uh, you can get uh, ostracized from society. You can get removed from it. You can have your access to your bank account removed. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is the reality of the world. And so what Bitcoin does, but Bitcoin represents that taking back of control from the state. As I said, the government, the government, their role is to support and look after the constituents who vote them in. We are not meant to be slaves to the government. Okay? We are meant to be the people who are in control. Now, I have a new form of money called Bitcoin. It doesn't matter what, they cannot freeze it. I can store my Bitcoin in my head by memorizing 24 words. I don't because I'm stupid and I forget stuff, but I can. Okay? Nobody can stop me. If I choose to send that money to you, nobody can stop me. There's zero they can do, okay? Nobody can stop me leaving this country with that Bitcoin, that Bitcoin uh, uh, in, on a hardware wallet or stored somewhere. And that to me is a bit of control taken back from the government. That is, that is, that is just a, uh, to me it's like a check and balance on the government to say, you know, you cannot control this part. And I, I think it's just an important little win, you know, as we kind of slide into this dystopian future for me, it's just this little whim that we have. Mm. And the great thing about the Bitcoin network, it keeps growing. Every four years, it grows. And there are more Bitcoiners. And those Bitcoiners are starting to educate themselves. So this is like, again, one of the most important things I think about Bitcoin. It isn't buying Bitcoin and making money. It is the rabbit hole you go down when you learn about what money is, how it works, and what a functioning democracy should be. And by the way, it's not every Bitcoiner. Some of them are libertarian. Or some of them anarchists and believe we should have no state. But the rabbit hole of information it sends you down the things you learn are more important than the buying of the Bitcoin itself. And I understand you also think it's the best form of money. I do, so yeah. talked about it as a rebellion against totalitarian, authoritarian globalism, to yeah. stick all the words in. But you also think it's the best form of money. Yeah, because you can be anywhere in the world. Okay, so I'll give you another example. I went out to Japan and did an interview and I hired a local cameraman. I could not find a way to connect my bank account to his to send him money. I could not send him over PayPal. There was blocks. He sent me a Bitcoin address and he had the money in 10 minutes. Okay, that was done. Transaction done. Um, I, on the Lightning Network, can send, I can send Bitcoin to anyone in the world instantly and it settles instantly. There is no friction. There's no rent seeker in the middle. Okay, there is no surveillance in the middle. I am allowed to voluntarily interact with anyone and share and send value to them in the world at any point, okay? That to me is a brilliant form of money. The second reason it's brilliant money is it changes the incentive model. At the moment, what happens if you save money in the bank? They lend it out. No, what happens to your money? Like what like physically happens to the value of the money you keep in the bank? Well, it goes down. It's a, it's a melting ice cube. Yeah. You have a hundred pound in there next year, it's purchasing power might be 90 pound the year yeah. after. You know, it might be 85 the year after that. It's a melting ice cube. The reason it's a melting ice cube is because they debase it constantly. Mm. Now, Bitcoin, you cannot debase. It is volatile, and we can come to that and we can talk about that, but it cannot be debased. There's only 21 million. And because it's kind of essentially deflationary, some people argue it isn't, it makes you consider your purchases. So the incentive model for our money in the bank right now is to spend it, right? If I had a million pound in the bank, 
I'd be an idiot to leave it in there. I need to at least find an investment where it's going to get 10% return every year, or I need to spend it and, and enjoy myself. But I need to get value from it mm. because the value is decreasing. If you look at the Bitcoin price chart, right? One guarantee is every four years, it goes up in value, pretty much. Every four years, it goes up in value. So, you know, Laszlo, who bought the, the uh, Bitcoin, he bought the pizza for 10,000 Bitcoin, you know, years ago, now, if I'd have just kept that, that would be worth hundreds of millions. Money in the bank is a depreciating liability. So, th this is, I think it was Jeff Booth, He's, he wrote a book called The Price of Tomorrow. It's all about uh, uh, inflation and deflationary technologies. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure he said, when the money isn't scarce, everything else is. Right, yeah, that makes sense to me completely. Because I want everything but money right now. Yeah. I just bought a 1989 911 Turbo. Nice. Yeah, 130 grand, because I would, if I lose 10% a year on that Porsche, which I won't, that'll go up. That's less than money. So my money is better in an old car than it is in the bank. Artwork, trainers, Bitcoin, front row of the Knicks, old classic cars. Yeah. Um, when the money isn't scarce, everything else is. If the money's scarce, then everything else isn't. Yeah. I hold Bitcoin because it's scarce. Mm. I have very high conviction. I have no conviction on what my value of my Bitcoin will be tomorrow. It could be anything. I have very high conviction in 10 years' time, everything I've got in Bitcoin is going to be worth considerably more than it is now yeah. because it is a scarce monetary asset. Okay? People in Venezuela dump the Bolivar as soon as they can and they get dollars because that money is The same happened in Zimbabwe, the Lebanese pound, the Turkish lira. People get rid of those currencies because they're crap. They want something that holds value. Bitcoin is the best version of that, but it's very early. A lot of people don't trust it, they think it's weird, so it's volatile, but it's mm. the best form of money. This is one of its downsides, isn't it? Because, I mean, I see a lot of the Bitcoin community and I almost see like, they're almost like, they're so evangelist, they can't see the downside. And they're betting everything on something that's, what, 20 years old? Is it 20 years old? What is 13, it? 14 years old. Okay, so. 2009. Yeah. Came. Actually, January Not a lot of history behind it. No? And you said money um, for evolution every 90 odd years. Yeah, fiat currency 90 years, gold 5,000 years. Is it 5,000 years? I think it's 5,000 years. So, what, so are you saying Bitcoin could be the next 5,000 year currency? Well, it can be the next infinite currency if it's the best. Until the can sun... Can anything really be infinite? I mean, well, you, you... I say in, in, until, until humans destroy themselves or the well, sun... that's definitely not infinite, sun, is it? The sun burns us. What I'm saying is... Four it, billion years. You know, the reason it can be the permanent future currency is because it is decentralized so no one can corrupt it. And once it's the best form of money, everyone will want to use it, okay? Yeah. All the other currencies were kind of coerced or forced into using. China, you have no choice what you use. You know, here we have a bit of freedom. You can you know, go and buy other currencies and yada yada. You can, I could pay you in Bitcoin if I wanted to. Yeah. I could pay you in, I could probably convince you to take dollars. You know, if I offer you 10% more, you know you can go and exchange it. Yeah. Um, it can be the, if, if it wins, and we haven't won yet. When you say win, like it becomes what? It becomes the dominant global, either form of money or reserve currency. My, I think it ends up becoming a, it's the global reserve currency. Once it's done that, it's won. Once oil settles in Bitcoin, gold settles in Bitcoin, intra-bank settlement is Bitcoin. Mm. FTX, Sam Bankman-Fried, what happened there? Well, it's just a con man. Yeah. Just a fraud. He's, uh, he's, he's the crypto Bernie Madoff. It's just a, just a con man. It's like no other, no other thing. It's, it's got nothing to do with Bitcoin. It's just he's a con man. Yeah, people didn't really understand um, that uh, an exchange is not a decentralized platform, did they? No. No. He, he just lied. You might as well just given him your money. Yeah, I mean, he's just like, I've, yeah, he, he raised a shit of money, built a successful business, but he didn't have anyone keeping an eye on it. Like, if, if you're. If you're investing $200 million into an entrepreneur, surely you're going to do some due diligence, put somebody on the board and have regular meetings. And have collateral on the money. Yeah, that, that as well. But, but surely you're going to do that. But they didn't. They just trusted him. And they trusted him with hundreds and hundreds of millions. And by the way, I was fooled. I was like, wow, this kid's done it. 
he's created this business, like everyone's using FTX, he's got Tom Brady selling ads, fair play to him. I never used the exchange, but honestly, I could have got caught. If they'd have called me up and said, we want to sponsor your podcast, I'd go, yeah, great, I'll take your money. Because they did, I th- they did to a lot, didn't they? A yeah, because yeah. I thought they were legit, Yeah, you know? And then that was a real reminder, like Bitcoin to say, don't trust verify. Yes. Don't trust I mean, that's pretty good. verify. Yeah. Or trust but verify. Yeah. Whatever. But like yeah. nobody verified. And now it's like, holy this was an abs this was another Ponzi. Right. But no, he's I mean to me he's got nothing to do with Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, the story has nothing to do. If anything, he proves the story of Bitcoin. Because if you left your Bitcoin on FTX, you're an idiot because you can self custody it. Yeah, I can have it on my phone, I can have it on a multi wallet. People didn't. You ever heard the term, not your keys, not your Bitcoin? No. Okay, what that means is, do you not have any Bitcoin? Yeah. Okay. So, my wife manages our account. Okay, yeah. so when you have a Bitcoin wallet, account wallet, yeah. it comes with a huge amount of responsibility. Yeah. It's a decentralized system. You hold that Bitcoin, but you are self-sovereign. If you lose your private key, you lose that Bitcoin. Yeah. There is no customer service. You send it to somebody else and it's the wrong person, you but do you, you like that about yeah, Bitcoin, by the way? Yeah, I'm self-sovereign. Yeah. Nobody can get to my Just Bitcoin. Just explain self-sovereign. It means I hold my money. So the bank, my pounds are, are stored in it. Well, yeah. not all of them, but a lot, most of my pounds are stored in the bank. Now, if the bank, if there's a run on the bank and I can't access my money, I can't access my money because they control it. Yeah. I can't keep and it. They've let most of it out anyway. Yeah, and I can't <laughs> keep it as cash under the mattress because that's you know, dangerous and mm. it's risky. But with Bitcoin, I am my own bank. I hold my, I, if it's on my phone, I hold that there. Mm. It is a bearer instrument, okay? Bearer asset. If I send it to you, you then hold it. You, because it's controlled by what's known as a private key. That is the key that allows me to send it, okay? And so anyone who held their Bitcoin on FTX and didn't remove it, didn't understand, they didn't follow those it's simple like giving rules. giving it to a bank, but it is. one that's it is. about to go bust. So what yeah. he did, he isn't a Bitcoiner, he doesn't understand Bitcoin, he doesn't support Bitcoin, he's a Bitcoin salesman, and he's a fraud, and he proved why Bitcoin is the best form of money. Um, how did, in a few words, how did he prove that Bitcoin's the best form of money? Because he, he ran a Ponzi scheme. Bitcoin, like when people call Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme, it's literally the opposite of a Ponzi scheme because we're self-sovereign, because we hold the asset, okay? He, he, was able to operate a Ponzi scheme because he gave, he allowed other people to give him their money and controlled it for them. He put that money in a black box, the same as Bernie Madoff did, the same as the banks do, okay? Mm. The only way you can be self-sovereign is cash, gold, Bitcoin. Watches. Watches, things, things? Yes, tradable things that Thing, have... Yeah, or tradable things that you take possession of, Yeah or Bitcoin. Bitcoin mm. is the only digital property which you can hold yourself and no one can touch. Everything else can be taken away. Mm. Did you buy a football club with Bitcoin? Not with Bitcoin, <laughs> but I made in the Bitcoin club. I love this top, by the yeah, way. Better. I, I um, saw it for about a minute before I saw the Bitcoin B. That, that didn't jump out. So um, you bought a football club. Yeah. This is, I'm, I love Liverpool. This is really interesting. I mean, Alan Sugar, I, I know him relatively well and he said to me and famously said one of the worst things he did was buy a football club why did you buy a football club i like making decisions <laughs> uh look i'm from bedford uh and like you i support liverpool but don't have a liverpool accent i get to go see him occasionally but and i love them but it doesn't have that like thing where it's like my town mm. Um, and when I was a kid, you'd just pick a big team. I didn't even know Bedford had a team. Um, uh, and the older I got, the more I realised I wish I'd had that thing with my mates. I went to my local team and supported them. I, you know, my dad used to tell me the stories of when he used to go and watch Accrington because you know, that's where he's from. And, and you know, they used to get in the car and go and follow them. And I always thought, I wish I had my own, I wish Bedford had a team. And so I always liked the idea of buying, I always thought, oh, I'll be rich as an entrepreneur and, and I'll buy them. And I never really got rich, not rich enough, well, not rich, but certainly not even wealthy enough to buy a football team. And then all that happened is like the podcast got really successful. I know lots of rich people because they're Bitcoiners and they got an early. 
and I've got this platform where people listen to the show or follow me on Twitter, and I went, I think I can put the two together. I think if I can buy the football team, and I can kind of make them the Bitcoin team, and then get all the Bitcoiners behind it, you know, ask a few kind of people who've got successful businesses or a bit of money to get behind and support it, and see if I can take this team from the 10th tier into the fourth tier, which is in the Football League. That's, that's it. That's what the plan is. So you raised money to buy the club from people in Bitcoin? No, no, no. The, the club doesn't cost anything. It was the 10th tier of English football. I mean, right. I, I haven't said how much I paid for it, but it was negligible. It's a small mm. amount. It's, it's negligible compared to the cost of actually doing this. Yeah. To do this, it has to become a functional, sustainable business. But we need good players, you know, ground, work done. The ground. There's a lot to do to build a football club. And, and it needs supporters. And by making it a Bitcoin team or the team the Bitcoiners follow, that allowed me to essentially raise them up a bit. How? Like give them a kickstart. Well, so firstly, yeah, at this level, most clubs just don't have any money. I went out by making this a brand and the team that I'm behind, I could interest sponsors to put money behind it. And then because I got sponsors to put money behind it, I'm able to go out there and get sign a good manager. And that manager has a budget to get the best players. I would say... 70% of promotion is budget. If you, if you haven't got a budget, if you can't compete, it doesn't matter how good your manager is, you, you will not be in contention. Okay? And that's not always the case. You have yeah, flukes. FSG of Liverpool sort of bucked that trend with the money ball method, didn't they? <laughs> not Sort of. I mean, you I mean, say that. They anywhere near a lot, as much as the other, a lot of the other clubs. Yeah, and they're behind them. Like, I'm saying 70% puts you in contention. Right, yeah. So if you say the top six is contention, 70% of the budget will get you there. Yeah. Okay? It's no coincidence that Arsenal, Liverpool, Man City, Chelsea, kind of up there. I mean, Tottenham bucked that trend. They, you know, they spend money and they're still s***. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 70 cents the money, 30% is... I, if we want to keep it as simple as possible, 70% money, 30% manager. Right. Or 60% is money, 40% is manager. Yes. You have to have a budget, but you have to have a manager who can spend that budget, allocate, capital allocate, that, well. allocate that capital, get the right players and motivate them. Yeah. Maybe you want to say, actually, it's like 10% it's luck. Yeah. You, know, you could have a great season and you just, a, player, a star player gets injured or whatever. Yeah. But you have to have budget. And now we have budget, so we could sign the, some good players. Now, we don't have the biggest budget, how did you raise hundreds of thousands? I've got this as a question. You raised like hundreds of thousands, I think like nearly a million quid in sponsorship, didn't you? It's a bit less than that, but it, but it was t a two year deal and it was more like, I go and say, look, I'm, so when I go and get my next round of sponsorship, it won't be that high, but it's like, I need a kickstart to this because there's so much that needs to end. The amount of money we spent on the ground, and, you know, putting an irrigation system, getting our branding sorted, ordering merch, like we needed that bump. It's, call it like a seed capital. We needed that. And how did you raise it? Well, I just no. It's, it's, it was sponsorship, but it acted like Sea Capital. Right. Why have you called it Ray Al Bedford? I just thought it'd be funny. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Yeah. Also, look, there's another Bedford team, Bedford Town. I did try and get them, and they wouldn't sell. There's a lot of confusion between the names. People do not forget Ray Al Bedford. Yeah. They're like, is it real? Is it real? What like Madrid? Yeah. It's not a distraction from your businesses. How many businesses you got? Five-ish. If this opportunity came up tomorrow that was a sixth, would you do it? Absolutely yes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I've got another one that's come up, like Emma's... It's an addiction. We were talking about that earlier. It is an addiction. Well, I cannot, yeah. I cannot, you cannot change no. this about me. No. You talk to my dad afterwards, he's going to go, people's like this since he was 14. I cannot do anything else. Yeah. I cannot stop. I have to do things. But I think the businesses I have, they, they're all kind of symbiotic. If the football club is successful, well, the day I announced the football club, I had record downloads on the podcast. Yes. People are checking out the football club because of the podcast, and people are checking out the podcast because of the football club. It's right. symbiotic. Um, and so any business I do, you know, when I make films, it's symbiotic to the, they're all symbiotic. They all yeah. have this symbiotic relationship. Yes, it's a distraction, and yes, it's stressful, and yes, we're busy, but it's the best thing in the world. This has been so much fun. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being on the show. Peter. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. I actually spent hours with Peter and we really hit it off. We support the same football club, we're into the same music, but I would love your thoughts. What did you think of this interview with Peter McCormick? Let me know in the comments.